We're going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. And I tell you, I, just, uh, I, I am just so excited about uh, what the Lord is doing. Uh, I told our prayer group last night that even in reading and studying, uh, God has given me just more enlightenment. He is, you know, I'm seeing things that I have never seen before. I, this is my third time that I will teach uh, the book of Revelation. And I just thank God for opening uh, you know, Scripture and for shedding that light on Scripture. And, and folks, it is where we live today. It is, the, it is what is happening. And I still say, I said it uh, when we did our introduction message, uh, I believe the next thing on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And I believe it could happen any day now. And we need to be ready, folks. We need to be ready. And I believe uh, the book of Revelation uh, gives us great insight to what is going to happen. Today I'd like to talk to you about the second church of the seven churches. And we titled this the Persecuted Church. The Persecuted Church. Let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin or following along with us. Number one, the challenged church. Man, it was a challenge in those days even to go to church. And I'll explain that in just a little bit. Number two, the suffering saints. There was much suffering. And I understand we live in a world of suffering. I understand that, you know, bad things happen to good people. But their suffering was directly in proportionate with their persecution. And I read one historian this week that said the time in the period which this church is speaking of was the most uh, persecuted church, and there were more Christian lives lost in a 10-year period than sometimes in a whole century of other times. So it was a suffering church. People suffered because they were Christians. And the third thing I want you to see is the encouraging words. Folks, I am telling you, the Word of God is encouraging. We need to understand uh, how much God is, is for us, how He is with us, how He is in us. And I'm telling you, He and every one of these gave some encouraging words to these churches. You know, throughout history, there's always been the persecution of the church. Satan has seen uh, to it that strong opposition comes from the lost world, and sometimes it comes within the church itself. We have to remember, Satan divides and God unites. A good thing about persecution is that it can unite a church, it can purify a church, it can strengthen a church, and it can be a testimony in both worlds. The church at Smyrna displayed the power and the grace a church can have when they face trials and adversity. The example they uh, set for shows how to properly respond to satanic attacks. Let me tell you, fo folks, I know you know this, but Satan is alive and he is well. He is trying to destroy families. He's trying to destroy marriages. He's trying to destroy our church. He's trying to destroy our country. So we need to be aware of these attacks. And the church at Smyrna is one of, the, one of the two churches, and Philadelphia was the other one, that received no rebuke from the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus looked at this church, he said, as a church, well done, my good and faithful servants. May, may we learn as this church and as individuals how to thrive in the face of fierce persecution. And folks, I'm not talking about persecution like we see it today, all right? One of the things that the emperor would do, he would take Christians who would not uh, renounce Christ, and he would go uh, you know, to these huge stadiums, and he would make a public display of them. They were crucified in front of thousands. They were burnt to death at stakes. They were fed to lions, and they were even boiled in oil. And my thought today is, would we do that for our Lord in Jesus Christ, our Savior? And we have to understand, folks, there is persecution coming, and it is going to get more intense as we move on. 
You know, the city of Smyrna is one of the oldest cities in the Greek world. Some historians said it could date back to 3000 B.C. It's been said that Smyrna is the most beautiful city in Asia. It is located on the Gulf of the Aegean Sea and had an excellent harbor and was a trade center. Two pagan temples, uh, one of Zeus and one of Apollos, were located there. And, of course, those were Greek gods. Uh, Smyrna was well known as the center of science in medicine also. It was a wealthy city. There were a large variety of coins found there uh, in, in, as, as they were hunting and, and seeing things and, and learning more about the city. And the time period that we are talking about is 100 to 300 A.D. Now let's look at Scripture by the way, this is the shortest letter also. There's only four verses to this letter. And number one, the challenge church. Jesus is still writing in verse 8, chapter 2, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna. And again, you know, I believe there's a guardian angel looking after every church, but I believe this particular message is, and Jesus addressed the angel uh, in each of these churches was to the pastor, okay? The pastor was to get the message from God and share it with the congregation. These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. And this is one of the things that, that I, I, I learned that I had never thought of before till this week. He starts, Jesus starts the same way and ends the same way in when they're talking about all seven churches. And when it talks about these are the first and the last, these are the descriptions of what we talked about in chapter 1. So he takes each one of those descriptions of who Christ is and uses those examples in each of the seven openings of the church. And we say that the first, the first is Jesus always was. See, God wasn't created. God always was. And Jesus is the same. Jesus and God are one. The Holy Spirit makes up the Trinity. And there are people that don't understand the Trinity. But folks, I am telling you, they are all the same, but they have different functions. It's like water. Water can be liquid. Water, if you boil it, can be steamed. If you freeze it, it can be ice. And they all have separate functions. And so it gets in our mind and it helps us with knowing that God the Father created everything. Jesus the Son died on the cross for our sins. And the Holy Spirit comes in our lives. That Acts 2 church, that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down, Jesus went up and the Holy Spirit came down and dwells in every believer. You should say amen about this time. Amen. Folks, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. It is our guide. It is our compass. It is what convicts us. It is what helps us pray. So the first and the last, who was dead, Jesus died on a cross but he came, uh, came to life. Folks, I am telling you, we're two weeks away from Easter. Two weeks. And I'm so excited about what God's doing today to, to observe the baptisms. Next week, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. And the week after that, we have Easter Sunday. I am telling you, I know Baptists don't shout much, but we're getting real close to shouting time, okay? Number nine, I know your works. Folks, God knows everything. He knows everything you do, everything you say, everything you think. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God. And this church worked at what it was doing. They labored. Work means labor. They were witnessing for Christ. They were telling their friends about Christ. And folks, we're talking about at a high price. At a high price. Matter of fact, the emperor at this time, one of the things during, the, the, during this time and this period he liked to do, he liked to find the Bibles in those small pieces 
of the Bible, and he would confiscate that, and he would go through houses and rummage them, and he would burn those pieces of Bible in the center square saying, you need to worship me. I'm telling you, if you go grab my Bible and start to burn, I'm telling you, them are fighting words for me. I know we're not supposed to fight, but I'm just telling you, that's what they were going through. The tribulation, the tribulation, all this, uh, you know, pressure and uh, all these things that uh, were going against the, the Christians and, and making mockery of Christians. They were going through that. And poverty. It's interesting that he used the word poverty here. But in further study, the reason they were in poverty and poor was because it was a trade center and people had businesses and Christians had businesses. And if they were lost, they got along with all the other trade people. But when they got saved, they, wouldn't, they would do things in an honest manner. So they were blackballed. People would quit coming to their place of business because they were Christians. And they suffered financially for the cause of Christ. But notice that little parenthesis next. But you are rich. Hey, I got news for you folks. You're looking at a rich man. Now don't look at my bank account. That's not what I'm talking about. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My father lives in the perfect place. My father controls this world. My father says yes, and my father says no, all for my own good. Oh, listen to me, folks. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a rich person. You have heaven. We get this. We get to worship in heaven too. Oh, quit. I I'm just telling you, folks, we, we as Christians sometimes... We just we complain and we gripe and we do things. Folks, we are so blessed. We are so blessed. These folks were poor. They didn't have the money, but yet they were rich. And Jesus is, reminds them of what they do have. Folks, if it was only eternal life, if that's all we had, we are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say, they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Wow. The synagogue of Satan. Folks, that's where Satan dwells. Okay, Jesus Christ is here. But I'm telling you, there were a group of people that worked for Satan. They went against the church. They went against Christians. They blaspheme. Folks, blaspheme is hate. They slandered. They gossiped. They did everything they could to make the Christian's life miserable. And Satan, I'm telling you, he has his crowd. And if you haven't noticed, they like to hang around Christians also. Why? To tell us how wrong we are. To tell us how narrow-minded we are. Folks, the Word of God is truth. We're not narrow-minded. We're Christ-minded. We're biblical-minded. It doesn't matter what the world says. It only matters what Jesus says. And he was saying, the devil is going to attack you. He's going to be out there. He's going to discourage you. And don't get down. Don't be surprised. John chapter 15. Go with me there. John 15. John 15, verse 18. Jesus himself said this, If the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. Think about that. Folks, they hated Jesus. Why? Because he stood for love. They hated Jesus because he rebuked them and he told them the truth from the word of God. They hated Jesus because he didn't go with the flow. And it says, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world, will, the world would love its own. And folks, there is a division. There really is. There is 
saved folks and there's lost folks. There are people that are desiring Christ and wanting to, you know, obey Christ. And there are those who hate Christ. They hate the Word of God. They don't want to hear about church. They don't want to hear about testimonies of what God is doing. Yet because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Twice, Jesus said, the world's going to hate you. Don't take offense to that. It's just the way the world is. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Folks, what did Jesus come to do? He came to serve. He came to serve. And if we are serving, they think we are weak. But I'm telling you, we as Christians, we are strong. We are strong. We can face opposition. We can face persecution. And we can look folks in the eye and we can quote a scripture, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Folks, never be ashamed of being a Christian. A servant is not greater than a master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you, listen, for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Oh, folks, the Christians were supposed to bow down and worship an emperor. The Christians were supposed to put up with these pagan gods that were all over the city and they were selling. The Christians were not to mention Jesus' name in front of anyone. And I'm telling you, you talk about getting me fired up. You don't mention Jesus' name, I'll say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'll say it as much as I want. You don't decide what I say. And Jesus is Lord. So we see here that they were rich. And by the way, you know what really bugs the lost world? We have things they don't have. See, everybody looks at the bottom line and looks at your bank account, looks at what, you, what house you're in and, and what you drive. That's the world's way. But you know what we have that they don't have? Salvation. You know what else they don't have? Joy. Peace. Love. Long-suffering. Patience. We have things money can't buy. Oh, folks, we're rich. Even though this church was a challenged church, Jesus said, you guys are awesome. You guys are doing a great job. So we see the challenged church. And number two, we see the suffering saints. The suffering saints. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Folks, as long as you live on earth, you are going to suffer. And we always want to blame somebody, okay? I, I enjoy, you know, seeing where this blame game goes. And do you know what we do even as Christians? We all go back to Adam and Eve. Well, if Eve hadn't picked that apple, if Eve wouldn't have given it to Adam, if Eve and, and Adam wouldn't have done this and wouldn't have done that, we would still be living in a utopia. Well, let me tell you something. If Mike and Lori was there, we would have probably done the same thing. And you would have done the same thing also. So why is there suffering in the world? Folks, it's because of sin. It's because of sin. And we have to understand that sin is always going to be prevalent in our world until Jesus Christ comes back and gets us. It doesn't give us a license to sin because as a Christian, we should not want to sin. It just simply means that, folks, we have to deal with that. Because of sin, there will always be suffering. My mother died of cancer, and it was a painful death. It was nine months of, of just suffering. And I'm telling my, my mom, to me, was a saint, okay? She raised, my dad worked all the time. I had a great father, I'm not saying that. But I'm just telling you, mom 
was the stay home at mom to just just I mean just when you look at her you would just think now there's a godly woman and it, there were times that my in my mind I would cross I, it would cross my mind God why are you allowing this why are you allowing this and God would always take me to that verse for my grace is sufficient folks there's always grace in time of suffering nobody likes to suffer but folks there is a purpose romans 8 28 for all things work together for good to those who love god and those who are called according to his purpose so we have to deal with suffering and these folks were suffering they were suffering greatly and notice the first three words of verse 10 do not fear. Satan's number one tool against Christians is fear. He wants you to be afraid. He wants you to be scared. He wants you to cower under. And folks, we should not fear. The Bible says we should not fear. 2 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Look at this. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a, us a spirit of fear. Well, if it's not from God, who's it from? Well, we know it's Satan. Satan wants you afraid. But we have nothing to fear because we have God on our side. But of power. What's power? The Holy Spirit. Then we've got the Holy Spirit in, in, inside of us. We have love. We have God's love inside of us. Inside of us. And we should, knowing how much God loves us and knowing how much God cares for us, we should not be afraid and of a sound mind. Here's the deal. You've already given your heart and life to Jesus, but Satan messes with your head. And folks, there's two ways, two ways, really three ways that you can battle Satan immediately. Number one is prayer. You can battle Satan with prayer because you can't think two thoughts at one time. If you are praying, you're not, you're not thinking about that negativism and, and his attack on your life. Two is memorizing Scripture. Memorizing Scripture. What did Jesus do when he confronted Satan himself? You probably will never confront Satan himself. You just, demons are enough for you, okay? Because Satan can only be at one place at one time. What did Jesus say? It is written. What are some verses? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What are some verses? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have all these verses in the Word of God, so we need to pray. We need to memorize Scripture. And I tell you what helps me, especially at night, Christian music. I have a set of headphones that sit right on my, my nightstand right there. And after I do some praying, and I'm telling you, the, the thing about the prednisone is it will keep you up at night, okay? And so about 3 o'clock in the morning, my eyes are just wide awake. And I'll pray first. I'll put those headphones on. Today, I slept. This is the longest I've slept in months. I slept till 6.45 this morning. Folks, I am telling you, we have tools we can battle Satan. And Satan wants us to suffer. He wants to hurt us. But he cannot. He cannot do those things because greater, God is greater. And, and when I think of suffering, folks, I think of Job. You talk about a story. And you know the story of Job. Folks, I'm telling you, he lost everything everything. He lost houses. He lost cattle. He lost, uh, you know, possessions. And he lost his children, which is the hardest one of all. But yet the Bible says at the end of chapter 1, Job did not sin against God. And he said, naked I came into this world, and naked I'm going out. Blessed be the name of of the Lord. Folks, I pray to God that if I ever suffer even close to that, I can have that same 
attitude. Folks, God is with us. God is with us. 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. Look at this. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Look at this. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Folks, people care. I understand that. But nobody cares more than Jesus. Nobody cares more than God. Now look at verse 8. Be sober. That means serious. Be vigilant. That means persistent, consistent. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy you. I'll never forget the first time we went to Turpentine, Turpentine uh, Animal Park or whatever it is. And we got there at the closing. We actually went to buy tickets for the next day. And it was after they closed, and it was feeding time. And we just start hearing these noises. And we're thinking, what in the world? And it just got louder and louder. And I'm telling you, some of them were so loud, I'm thinking, I sure hope one of those don't get out. Why? They were chomping on that meat and they were ah they were they were eating and folks that's what satan wants to do he wants to chew you up and destroy you he's a roaring lion now look at verse 9 resist him steadfast in the faith you can't be you can't be passive about this you can't you know look at your life and say well i guess this is just what god wants me to do no, folks, he wants you to rise above that. He wants you to live a powerful life for him, knowing that the same sufferings uh, are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Folks, I'm telling you right now, there are people that are in third world countries that die for the cause of Christ. They have a Bible, and if they, that Bible is found, they can be thrown in jail in third world countries. It says, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while. Now look at the purpose in suffering. Perfect. It's to perfect you. It's to make you a better Christian. It's to make you more mature in Christ. It's to make you depend on Christ more. Establish you. Establish your faith. Establish your walk. Establish your testimony. Strengthen us and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever. Amen. Hey, folks, I got news for you. God has the last say. God. And he is inside of you. And suffering, folks, is just part of life. You can't get around it. It's going to happen. But there are things that you can do Things that we will help when you are attacked by the evil one. So we see the challenged church. We see the suffering saints. And last, I want you to see the encouraging words. The encouraging words. Look at the rest of verse 10. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Folks, I'm telling you, we all have been tested. We have been tested. And I've even heard people say, you know, I, and, and folks, I would not say this if I were you. Okay, I'm going to help you out here. Do not make this statement. Well, what else could happen? You know what you just did? You just told Satan that there's an issue that you have with this. You just told Satan... I can, I can handle this up to this point, but after this, I'm done. You're just waving a flag at him. Come get me. Folks, he can hear. Listen, folks, I'm telling you, you have to stand firm. Stand firm on what you are doing. You will be tested. Matter of fact, I think it's Warren Wiersbe that said a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Folks, did we truly get saved? Is the Lord Jesus Christ 
really in our life. And I know there were times of doubt. Mr. Thomas, Doubting Thomas, he got the nickname. I understand that. But don't stay there, folks. We are going to be tested. And as, as we get closer and closer uh, to uh, the rapture of the church, I believe we will be tested more and more. And it says, and you will have tribulation ten days. And again, in looking and researching, there were, there were a lot of opinions on what this ten days meant. One, one scholar said that the ten days meant that it was just a short time. Okay, just a short time. It was just kind of a figure of speech for that. Another said the 10 days really meant it was that 100-year period that we are talking about in the persecuted church where the, the church was persecuted the most. Then another one said, well, it was the Roman Empire and all of the 10 empires and their emperors. And there was literally a testing for that whole period of the Roman Empire. And you know what, you know what really matters? What really matters is the test is going to be real and the test is going to be short. That's my opinion. And you know why? Because when I think, I've lived 64 years right now, and when I think of all of eternity, my life is a blimp on the radar. I can go through anything for Jesus Christ, knowing that I have a place in heaven. So whatever it is there, I believe the intense thing will be a short compared to eternity. Be faithful unto death. Whoa! Did he really mean that? Folks, Jesus means everything he says. See, we, don't, we, we can't comprehend this. Because in the United States, we're not dying for the cause of Christ. You know, somebody insults us and we get our feelings hurt. When somebody insults me because I'm a Christian, you know what you really ought to do? You should say, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I am glad you realize, and I know they're going to think you're being smart, Alec, but if you say it with a straight face, I'm glad you realize who I am in Jesus Christ. It says, you will, have, uh, you will be tested and you will have tribulation to days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, folks, the crown of life is that crown we get because we are Christians, because we have been saved. Matter of fact, there's no time here to, to do this, but you know, uh, there's five actual crowns. And do you realize one of the crowns that you can have is a martyr's crown? If you die for the cause of Christ, the disciples, Paul, Stephen, if you die for the cause of Christ, you'll get a martyr's crown. Folks, I tell you, it would be an honor for me to get a martyr's crown. Verse, 13, verse 11, or 11, And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What is he talking about? Folks, people who are lost die twice. They die physically, and then eternally they die the rest of their life. It was the rich young ruler that said, in hell I lifted up my eyes. Oh folks, hell is real, and you don't want to go there. You need to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this day. You wouldn't have to die that second death. Revelation 20, 14. If you don't believe me, read it. There will be a judgment day. A judgment day. But what is he saying here? He who overcomes. We are overcomers. We are overcomers. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And I close with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? I'm telling you, uh, you know, death, it's, it's a one-time thing for us. We die. And the Bible, Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And by the way, there's things worse than dying. I'm serious. You go with me. You follow me into a nursing home or a, a, a veteran's hospital. 
I'm telling you. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, Hades, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of the sin is the law. Folks, you know, the law has saved no one. Has saved no one. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I say something today? Folks, we win. We win. We win. You're not a loser. You are a winner. Therefore, my beloved, I love you. My beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abound in the Lord's work. Be stubborn for Christ. Don't compromise. Stand for the truth. Preach and teach the truth. Walk in love. Be that lighthouse, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, folks, I am telling you, as God is my witness, if someone came up and put a gun to my head and said, you renounce Christ, or I'm pulling the trigger, my words will be, what are you waiting for? I'm serious. I know a lot of people just think that's crazy. But here's my thought. Jesus died for me. Why wouldn't I want to die for him? What keeps me from dying for him? You know what it is? Fear. All goes back to fear. But I'm telling you, if that happens, I will be ushered into the presence of God. And I will take a stand, my Lord and my Savior. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. God, it is so true. It is yes, it is amen. And God, I pray first for the Christian. God, are we truly walking with you? Are we truly making a difference? Can people really see you in my life? Or do we just blend in with the world? God, I'm not talking about trying to offend people. I'm simply saying living for Jesus Christ. God, I pray we would make a difference. We don't have time to be messing around. The end is near. I'm not a doomsday preacher. I'm a realist. I'm a biblical preaching realist. And God, I pray as Christians here today, I pray that they would seriously think about rededicating their lives to Christ, starting over, and, and, and Lord, just living for you every day, working for you every day. And God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I'm telling you, they're going to taste that second death. And God, it'll be horrible. And God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just pull at their heart today. And I pray if there's one here that needs to be saved, I pray that they would come forward. Others need to follow you in baptism as we witness today. Others may need to join the church, God. It's, it's you, God. It's you. So God, I thank you for what you're doing. God, we give you the glory. It's not about us. God, I pray that you would just open the windows of heaven. And God, I pray that we could see revival in our church and we could see revival in our city and we could see revival in our state and in our country. God, pour your Holy Spirit down today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoke to you in any way, would you come?